Okay, in this chapter we're going to cover the periodontal tissues, which includes cementum, the periodontal ligament, and alveolar bone. Now in the previous chapter we covered the dentin pulp complex, and we covered those two at the same time because they both developed from the dental papilla, which was a large mass of neuromesenchymal stem cells. These three tissues share something in common with one another in that they all develop from neuromesenchymal stem cells of the dental sac. And therefore, it's not only convenient to talk about them together, but there's a significant amount of overlap between these tissues because of their shared lineage. So the periodontium includes soft and hard tissues connecting the tooth to the alveolar bone. It includes cementum, parts of the alveolar bone, the periodontal ligament, and then we might even consider some gingival tissue as well. Let's begin with cementum. This is a thin layer of tissue covering the dentin on the roots. And similar to dentin and enamel, it is composed of the same minerals found in bone tissue, calcium hydroxyapatite crystals, as well as collagen fibers, which are a protein and a small amount of water. It is not as strong or as dense as enamel or dentin, and therefore shows up as more radiolucent than those tissues. But of course, having that mineral component makes it denser than pulp, so it's more radio-opaque than that. You may not be able to see this thin layer of cementum near the cemento-enamel junction, because I believe it gets blasted out by the much brighter layer of enamel. The cementum is the first of three tissues that we're going to talk about that develop from the dental sac. This is just a different region of neuronal mesenchymal stem cells than the dental papilla, the cells that are surrounding the invaginating epithelial cells. We call this ectomesenchymal tissue because, of course, it derives from the neural crest cells that migrated off of the neural tube to travel to this location and help induce the formation of tooth buds. First off, the epithelial cells have to begin migrating downwards. We call these epithelial cells Hertwig's epithelial root sheath. And it composes of both an inner and an outer enamel epithelium. The inner one, of course, being closest to the dental papilla, and the outer one being over here closest to the dental sac. The first thing that will happen is that the inner enamel epithelium, just like it was doing in the enamel organ, will be induced to turn into preameloblasts. And these will induce the formation of odontoblasts from nearby mesenchymal stem cells of the dental papilla. These odontoblasts will begin laying down dentin in the roots. But unlike in the previous chapter, this dentin cannot induce the formation of ameloblasts. And that's because this inner enamel epithelium is not in contact with stellate reticulum. So these epithelial cells will undergo apoptosis and mostly disappear. It's possible that some of them might actually turn into cementoblasts, it's not entirely sure. Nevertheless, some of the neuronal mesenchymal stem cells of the dental sac can now come into contact with dentin. The reason that this can only happen in one direction and not from the dental papilla side is that on the dental papilla side, these neuronal mesenchymal stem cells can only come into contact with these odontoblasts over here. So it's these neuronal mesenchymal stem cells that suddenly find themselves in a new environment. 
And in this case, the dentin can induce these cells to turn into cementoblasts and they will begin secreting cementum. This cementum will cover the dentin found in the roots. And just like the way that enamel and dentin were produced, cementum is first produced in an immature, not quite solid form that we call cementoid, and it gets mineralized a little bit later. But unlike both enamel and dentin, Sometimes these cementoblasts get trapped within the cementum that they're creating, and then they differentiate into cementocytes. This is a little bit more similar to how bone tissue forms, rather than the other two tissues we've talked about. Cementum is very similar to enamel, dentin, and bone tissue. It has cells in some regions of the root, but not others. We would call that cellular versus acellular cementum. All cementum will have Sharpies fibers from the periodontal ligament extending through this tissue. Those fibers are collagen fibers, and they will extend all the way into Tome's granular layer within the dentin. It's not that collagen fibers stop, in the cementum and then begin again in the dentin, they are continuous. And the reason that this can be is that the cementoblasts and the odontoblasts could be producing collagen first and then allowing cementum or dentin to mineralize around it later. This makes for a very strong connection. Dentin is not just glued to the surface of the cementum parts of the cementum and dentin actually extend through one another. And that can occur because of their shared lineage. They both come from a neuronal mesenchymal stem cell. That's going to be very different from our connection between epithelium and connective tissue that we saw in the oral mucosa. When we were talking about those tissues, the epithelium had to have reti pegs, which interdigited with the dermal papillae of the submucosal region, increasing surface area, because we had to glue one type of tissue to another type of tissue, and these two tissues did not share lineage. One was ectoderm, the other was mesoderm. Here, Dentin and cementum are both coming from mesoderm plus neuronal mesenchymal stem cells. Okay, so I mentioned before that some of the epithelial cells of Hertwig's epithelial root sheath seem to survive. Most of them go away, but a few of them will become the epithelial rests of malasse. So we're not really sure what they do. They may have no function whatsoever, but it is definitely attractive to think that these cells might be involved in wound healing. And in fact, there's some evidence for that. And the reason that we would think this is the case is that the epithelial cells were the ones that first induced the formation of odontoblasts, and then odontoblasts induced the formation of cementoblasts. So that perhaps later in life, after this tooth erupts, if there's some damage to the cementum or the dentin, it might be possible to form more dentin and then more cementum because of the reactivation of these epithelial cells. Now, we're not really sure if that is indeed what happens, but Remember our little phrase, wound repair recapitulates morphogenesis. Now, cementum can come all the way up to enamel, but sometimes it doesn't quite get there and it leaves behind a little region of exposed dentin. Usually it meets end to end with the enamel and a small percentage of the time it will actually overlap the enamel. 
Sometimes the surface of the cementum is not smooth and uniform, and small masses called cementicles may form. These are usually acellular cementum, meaning there are no cementocytes. This can happen more frequently in the elderly. These may be attached to the surface of the cementum, completely free of the cementum, or embedded with the cementum. Sometimes overproduction of cementum can occur, especially in response to some form of trauma. This generally occurs at the root apex, and you can see here on the radiograph the layer of cementum is significantly thickened. The opposite can occur as well. The resorption of cementum and dentin can both occur. This would be a totally normal occurrence during the exfoliation of a tooth, but sometimes this can be triggered accidentally later in life, especially in response to trauma or excessive orthodontic movement. If the cementum is repaired, it usually lacks Sharpie's fibers and therefore does not contribute to the attachment of the tooth to the alveolar socket. Now I discussed an enamel pearl in one of the previous lectures, but a cementicle would feel very different, and that's because cementum feels grainier than the smooth surface that is normal for enamel. Because cementum is not as highly mineralized as enamel, it is more prone to acid erosion and cemental caries. This becomes more prominent as people get older and as gingival recession occurs, exposing that cementum. Oh, you stinker cats, hang on one moment. Okay, I'm back. On to the periodontal ligament. This obviously helps to attach the tooth to the alveolar sockets. This also develops from the dental sac. The periodontal ligament, on the other hand, is composed mostly of collagen fibers made by fibroblasts, which also differentiate from mesenchymal stem cells found in this region of the oral cavity. The periodontal ligament is different from other ligaments in that it contains fibroblasts and a bunch of collagen fibers, but it contains some pretty weird cells for a ligament. It will have some cementoblasts and osteoblasts, as well as odontoclasts and osteoclasts, cells capable of removing bone tissue or dentin. It's important to remove dentin during exfoliation of a tooth, but we'll talk about removing bone tissue in maintenance and repair of healthy bone tissue in the last portion of this lecture. I covered some of the physiology of collagen fibers way back early in this series when we were talking about some of the basics of connective tissue. Really quickly, it's a protein made up of polypeptide strands that are then intertwined around one another. And then those are intertwined around other intertwined strands, making for a very strong protein. It is capable of resisting a whole lot of stress in one direction, much like a rope, but it bends in other directions. Nerve endings connected to these fibers can signal to the brain, giving the brain a sense of proprioception for these teeth. Proprioception is the sense of where our body is located in space, even if we're not currently looking at it. After endodontic therapy, all of the nerve endings of the pulp will be removed, but that tooth may still have a little bit of sensitivity thanks to the nerve endings associated with a periodontal ligament. Once again, the epithelial rests of malassez can be found scattered amongst the PDL. These are the remnants of Hertwig's epithelial root sheath after most of it disintegrated. 
Again, we're not really sure what these epithelial cells are doing way down here. It's possible that they might trigger wound healing later in life. Lastly is the alveolar bone, parts of the maxilla and mandible that are connected to the teeth. This is your typical bone tissue made roughly of two-thirds mineral calcium hydroxyapatite crystals and roughly one-third collagen and water. The basal bone are the parts of the maxilla and mandible that are not attached to the teeth, whereas we're going to be focused on the alveolar bone, the portion that contains the roots of the teeth. Where the roots fit into the bone is called the alveolus, or a little tooth socket. And this bone tissue can be called the cribiform plate. Most bone tissue that you see at the surface of any given bone is compact bone, but not here in the tooth sockets. There are bunches of tiny little holes for all of the periodontal ligaments, plus some extra blood vessels and nerve fibers to get out of the bone tissue and connect to the tooth or the periodontum. There's one other place where you can see a cribiform plate, and that was in the ethmoid bone, allowing little nerve endings to get from the brain into the nasal cavity for our sense of smell. The outer region of compact bone of the alveolar bone shows up a little bit more radio opaque on a radiograph. We call that the lamina dura. Right next to that, of course, is the lighter region of the periodontal ligament. The interdental septums are the regions of bone tissue between the teeth. They should be of uniform height. The interradicular septum is the portion of bone tissue found between roots of a multi-rooted tooth. As we're going to see, bone tissue undergoes changes. It is not a static, non-living tissue, but definitely a living, ever-changing tissue. And because of those changes, the position of the teeth can change over their time. And that is known as mesial drift because of the uniform direction in which this typically takes place. On the other hand, loss of bone tissue can lead to a loss of the connection between teeth and bone, which can lead to the loss of teeth. This may first be noticed in the alveolar crest. Healthy bone tissue is undergoing constant remodeling. Osteoclasts are constantly removing some bone tissue, eating it away with hydrochloric acid, and then they are followed up by osteoblasts, which then deposit bone tissue, and the net result will be completely new bone tissue is formed in a small region of the maxilla or mandible. That helps to ensure that tiny little bits of damage do not build up within bone tissue. It would be hard to spot little cracks inside of bone tissue because of the dense and solid nature of this tissue. It would be almost impossible for an osteoblast to get there and fix it. So instead, the body has developed this system wherein it just assumes damage will be accumulating over time and therefore, it constantly removes and replaces bone tissue. And as long as these two processes are happening at the same speed, this ensures that we have healthy bone tissue throughout life. On the other hand, if we lose a little bit too much bone tissue, it could leave behind a little window, making the root visible from the gum line. This is called a fenestration. If that is a cleft rather than more of a circle, 
we would instead call it a dehiscence. To repair this, we need to repair the bone tissue. And so that might involve adding a little bit of extracellular matrix from cadaver bone. That can be placed over the region where the bone tissue was lost. Chemicals might be added to this to help induce mesenchymal stem cells to migrate into the scaffolding that we have provided and replace this cadaver bone with healthy bone tissue made by the patient's own cells. Of course, after this, you might need to do a subepithelial graft to get the gingiva to now cover the bone tissue properly. But that was from a previous lecture. After the surgery, there will be a significant period of time where these tissues heal and grow. During this time, they're going to be at high risk for infection because they are not forming complete barriers between the saliva and the bloodstream. The addition of morphogens can speed up the healing process. These are the signals that can induce the growth of mesenchymal stem cells and epithelial cells, or they may induce the differentiation of the stem cells into the adult cells, such as osteocytes or keratinocytes. These morphogens are very small chemicals that can be incorporated into the extracellular matrix of the scaffolds that we either create artificially, or if we waited long enough, would be created by the body itself. To prevent an infection, a bandage could be used. A bandage is simply something that acts as a barrier between the bacteria and the viruses of the outside world and our bloodstream. But sometimes we might use something a little bit more complicated than a basic cotton bandage. One problem of bandages is that they stick to scabs. And therefore, when the bandage is removed, which needs to be done from time to time, it tends to break any scab that's been formed. And the fibrin within a scab can act as a scaffold along which mesenchymal stem cells uh, can migrate, speeding up the healing process. Therefore, membranes might be created from chemicals that are more similar to what we would find in the human body naturally. For instance, bandages made of collagen or polymers that are similar enough to collagen can be used that not only prevent microorganisms from getting into the bloodstream, but can act as a scaffold along which stem cells, like mesenchymal stem cells, can migrate and trigger the healing process. A bioactive membrane, on the other hand, would be one of these special membranes that's been embedded with morphogens. So we not only act as scaffolding, but it can help to recruit stem cells to migrate into this new scaffolding and to differentiate into the cells that we need. For instance, one important part of the healing process, whether it's bone or skin, is that we need new blood vessels. So we might add morphogens that trigger angiogenesis or the growth of capillaries into this cadaver bone tissue that we've just added to our patient. If teeth are lost, the alveolar bone tends to recede. So this changes the shape of the gum line. Basal bone will remain, but the alveolar bone is resorbed. With the loss of a lot of teeth, this can change the contours of the face significantly. Normally, the mandible is kept a distance away from the maxilla because of the alveolar bone and teeth. But take away the teeth and allow the alveolar bone to resorb. Now the 
mandible can come up a little bit closer to the maxilla. And that usually leads to protrusion of the chin, which sometimes gets called a Popeye chin like appearance. This will also change the nature of the skin attached to the neck, often leading to wrinkles. To prevent this, we can do dental implants, titanium and ceramic implants into bone tissue can help mimic the presence of teeth, preventing the loss of the alveolar ridge. So with a dental implant, there's often the need to do some repair to some lost bone tissue. So we may once again do some cadaver bone grafting. And then once that is healed, we can implant the artificial teeth and possibly do some gingival grafting as well. So this is a pretty significant series of operations. The typical dental implant is made of a titanium core with an abutment that then connects to the crown, which may be formed out of some type of ceramic. Connective tissue, unfortunately, does not stick to titanium. This is the part that's going to be embedded into the new bone tissue that we've provided. And we want a strong connection. Therefore, the titanium might be coated with hyaluronic acid, which helps connective tissues to adhere to it. Now, we covered hyaluronic acid back at the beginning of this chapter, excuse me, at the beginning of this term, that was one of the large molecules that you found in the ground substance. Therefore, by coating the titanium with this molecule, we're making the outside surface of this part of the dental implant mimic ground substance of connective tissue, which helps bone tissue to stick to it better. On the other hand, the mucosa that we're embedding this implant into can stick to this titanium with hemidesmosomes. Although we can speed that attachment up by using the correct type of morphogen. In this case, a fibroblast growth factor seems to do the trick. And this will help induce the formation of a seal, mimicking the junctional epithelium that we would find in a healthy tooth that would be attaching to the enamel by hemidesmosomes and preventing oral bacteria from getting into the bloodstream found within the submucosa. Inflammation around implants is called periimplantitis and with chronic inflammation we generally see the loss of tissue over time. In this case, we would see loss of supporting bone, which might lead to loss of this rather expensive implant. The reason that bone tissue can be lost is that it's normally undergoing a process of resorption, thanks to osteoclasts, and replacement by osteoblasts. But with inflammation, the osteoblasts go on hold they're going to wait to replace tissue until the immune system gives them the all clear that the area is now clean. But with chronic inflammation, that signal never comes. And so the osteoblasts slow down or stop. But for whatever reason, the osteoclasts keep going and this leads to bone loss. We can take advantage of this remodeling unit, the osteoclast and blast together when we do orthodontic therapy. Remember, bone tissue is constantly undergoing resorption and replacement, but osteoblasts can be induced to go a little bit faster with tension. Now, if we were talking about anywhere from the neck down, that tension would probably be coming from exercise as we put impact on our bones. That induces osteoblasts to work a bit harder and therefore exercise can actually increase bone density. And we know the more exercise people get when they're young, it tends to reduce or delay the onset of osteoporosis. 
Here in the oral cavity, though, we're going to take advantage of this by tricking some of the osteoblasts to slow down and others to speed up, namely the ones in the alveolar socket. And we're going to be altering the tension in different areas around the root of the tooth that's transmitted across the periodontal ligament. So by using wires or molds, we can try and force the tooth in one direction within the alveolar socket. This will cause the PDL on one side to go slack and on the other side to stretch. The side that is stretched is under higher tension and therefore the osteoblasts will work harder on that side to lay down more bone tissue. Whereas on the other side, those osteoblasts would be slowing down, which would lead to loss of bone tissue on that side. And the net result is that the alveolar socket doesn't change in size, just changes its location and the tooth shifts. Now it's important to get the tension just right because too much stress instead of leading to bone deposition could lean to resorption and this tooth would become loose in the socket. But if you get the tension just right, you'll get a little bit of bone loss on one side and a little bit of bone addition on the other side and the sockets will shift within the oral cavity. If too much tension is placed on a tooth chronically, another change that you might observe is a widening of the periodontal ligament. This would be noticeable on a radiograph as a wider region of radiolucent space between the cementum and the lamina dura of the alveolar sockets. And that wraps up this lecture. The little guy that you've been hearing purring and eating in the background is this dude here. He's much bigger and older now, and so am I. Anyhow, uh, I hope that this was good, and congratulations on finishing. <laughs>